Hey guys, welcome to episode 9 of my video blog. I apologize that last week part 5 of the Art of the Storyteller did not get uploaded. I ran into some YouTube problems. I'm not sure what they are. Let's find out if it works this time because I don't want to have to do this again. Because I actually don't, I remember most of what I said, but I want to try and get it as accurate as possible. Maybe I should keep a script and not wing it like I tend to do. As you guys know, I do a great deal enjoy winging things. I am what you would call a pantser as far as writing goes, but sometimes some of my best writing comes that way, and I sometimes wonder whether that's the best way to do it. Now, what I wanted to talk about this week on top... Well, I'll do my announcements first. Why the heck not? So, obviously, my announcements this week, as you know, as some of you may know, my collection of poetry, the famous <coughs> you Po, is now available both the paperback on Create Space and the ebook on YouTube on YouTube on Amazon in fact actually and just today with it being Christmas Merry Christmas everybody eh? a Merry ha Happy Hanukkah Happy Kwanzaa Happy Fest Feliz Festivus whatever you want to have enjoy it it's been a lovely day let's celebrate the birth of our saviour the green tree the spaghetti, flying spaghetti monster whatever you want to do you know, as you know, I have my beliefs. You are as entitled to have yours as I am of mine. Let's just make it a wonderful day. But in celebration of a non-specific winter festival, where gifts are exchanged, I have decided to give a gift to everyone who follows my blog, who follows my Facebook page, who follows my YouTube channel, to receive a free copy of said poetry collection which I will personalize for each and every one of you now check on my page my way, my email address is there send me an email request free copy yeah, as a subject line whatever you want to do email alanjfisher0 at gmail.com kind of clever I know send me that request I will personalize each and every one of you a copy and I will have it for you the personalized copies at least by next weekend by the end of 2017 which is almost here and what a year it has been hey guys what a year i started this year with not a clue on how to write my series and now over the course of the series we have come to something quite incredible i have somehow managed to write five novellas four short story and poetry collections and a poetry collection all together and i'm currently with my with my buddy joe really cool guy by the way at the moment writing another or beginning on another series of novella or novels should I say a trilogy in fact which I'm keeping on the stum and the down low for the moment but you'll see it's coming it's gonna be very very interesting so you're gonna like it it's gonna be very unlike anything I've written before and one shocking thing I had thinking of the art of the storyteller as I was going is that None of my characters that I've written so far in this book resemble any of the characters I've written in any of my other books before. I found the voice, I found the language, I found the identification to make these characters unique in many ways. They don't come even close to resembling any of my other characters, which is what I was aiming for. And also, because it, you know, it's a trap for a lot of us when we're writing that some of our characters in a different story resemble a character in another story or they resemble us ourselves that that person has a bit of us in it now as a writer as an author as a creator it's sometimes nigh on impossible to avoid putting a bit of yourself into your writing because your passion your joy your love of writing is what drives you to write and that passion gets translated in your ideas, your thoughts, your beliefs, your closely held love comes out in what you write. So it's very hard to avoid aspects of yourself coming out. And I can say Sham, Sham's a lot like me. He is Indian and I'm not, as you may have noticed. I don't really look like Indian and I'm, I'm actually not. But I've known lots of Indian people. I've had some very good Indian friends, including the actual inspiration for the character of Sham himself, who was also known by the name of Sham, in fact. I've also had many other people I've known along the way, and 
They've influenced some characters. I've, I've dropped a few little throwaway characters in of people I know. And they know who they are, actually. But to go back to the point, Sham has bits of me in him. Kaliadis, to a degree, has some of me in him. Alexander has a lot, at least in his outlook and his beliefs in certain things. Not everything, because I've tried to stay as close to the historic Alexander as I can. I have received some controversy about Alexander himself, about his at least temporary homosexuality or bisexuality, and his bipolar, and I saw his sociopathy or whatever it is that he's got. No one's really sure because everything is written in a time before these things had names. They were just, no, Alexander has his darknesses. And in ancient Greek culture at the time, homosexuality wasn't seen as something really worth talking about. They, they didn't really bother about it. But I wanted to keep it as accurate to the source material as I possibly could. Because I'm inventing, yes, a great deal. But the history is still the history. The personalities are still the personalities. Sham never existed. Alexander did. And so did many ancient Greek and Macedonian soldiers upon whom I based my other characters. I know even Korax. You know Korax, that guy in the background being bluff and funny. He's kind of based on me to a degree because he gives me an opportunity to lay out some of my own gosh down awful bad jokes, which I enjoy. Korax is like, he's there as a comic relief, but he's also there for some quite stunning and piercing insights that no one expects from him. But you know how that all works. But what I wanted to talk about really is, it's something I've talked about a lot. It's something that matters to me. It's something that should matter to you all. And it's something that should allow me to change the angle on my, on my, on my camera so you can see me better or at least see my gestures, because I've noticed that you, people who know me know I gesture an awful lot. I like to use my hands when I'm talking. If I'm not, if I have my hands behind my, tied behind my back, I cannot communicate. It's a bit of the Spanish element, but I think Irish has it in it too. I couldn't tell you. Anyway, what I wanted to talk about this week, last week in fact I talked about it, but no one got to see it apart from me, was something that means a lot to me, something I'm very passionate about. You know that these days, in many ways, we came up with a lot of recycled bubblegum pop music where everyone is auto-tuned, everybody is singing to a formula, they've got to do their little dances and their little twirlies and their little thingies while they're dancing and everyone has to have a, a routine that people can copy on the dance floor. Writing, I feel, maybe some way going that way because it's ha look at this. Every, I, I belong to several writers groups. Some are, shall we say, more traditional than others. Every, so many of them, the posts that I see, and here's the thing that I find most frustrating of all. I will write a darn good blog article. I will write a darn good preview of something that I have written. I will write a, one of my fictional background articles, and I recommend you do those, by the way because I enjoyed those, the what if, the what happened after. Because you may have seen, one thing I always thought about, you see, is when you see the movies, and especially like cop movies, or hero rescuing woman, or woman rescuing man from certain death against a, an organization of nasty folks, you, the movie always ends where they're someone wrapped in a blanket, being led away from having killed the main guy in a rather spectacular fashion, normally having shot them in the head or something like that. And the police are there. And the thing is, what happens afterwards, after that? Do they all live happily ever after, as the story is like to say? Or are they going to face Mr. Mr. Thingy? You just murdered a man. We have no evidence that this man was a bad guy in any way, shape or form, because you killed everyone related to it. Therefore, you've got to go to court and may potentially go to jail for third degree murder. Even first degree murder. And so I decided the movies like to leave that part out and forget about it, and they have their... <clears throat> 
the, the hero and the heroine have their kiss. The family's reunited. Everything seems happy. The music plays, the credits roll. I decided to look at that with the Skander Drago, Draco incident, for example. Things that I mention in novels are gonna have effects in the real world in which they take place. The fact that three men appear, or four, appear where they don't belong. What happens to the versions of them which are already there? Because if it's a parallel universe, a parallel world, versions of them are going to exist. So I came up with the three sleepers. People who went into a coma the instant those characters from the hegemony universe appeared. And I studied that and went into that and it gave an extra depth. I also had a few things about Skander Draco himself. An interview with a psychologist that surfaced after he died. Genetic studies done on, the bo on his body because no one could identify where he was from. And then later genetic studies on the bodies of his colleagues. You notice that the council made an appearance. They lodged a report about that incident. An investigation, everything that would happen in the real world that we tend to gloss over. Think about that. You have to think about, or at least think about even if you don't write about it, the real world consequences of what happens in your story. Now you may be in a completely invented world. And I did this quite intentionally where I had my characters take a little sojourn into a fictional world. Well, in not, shall I just give, I'll rewind that into our world, our real world, the one right here. So that I could do background in the world that we know, how they had an effect on the people that we knew, that the police were involved, that Interpol were involved, that pathologists and coroners were involved, and psychiatrists and psychologists and investigations and TV news reports and everything like that. Because for me to write what I'm writing, I have to have realism, truth in it. And for you to do the same thing, you have to think about if character X kills character Z, what's going to happen to character X once the last page is turned? Even if you don't write that down, you have to think about it because, say you decide to write a sequel, where is character X going to start out in that sequel? Is he going to start out in jail? Is she going to start out in a psychiatric ward? But there's one comparison I'll make and it's in an article I published last week on my blog The Wizard of Oz with what was her name again the ginger one um, I honestly forget her name oh my god you know the one the original one anyway happy dancey jumpy 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 original Wizard of Oz movie that was loosely based on Frank Obama's work because it was too happy choicey saccharine and then you come up with a return to Oz which was a sequel which achieved cult status but wasn't really a kids movie because Dorothy started the movie being taken to a psychiatric institution to receive electroshock therapy for delusions therefore consequence she comes back or should we say comes back or wakes up or however you want to take the ending of that movie believing she had been in another world now we know, and she knows, at least what really happened, or we think we know, but nobody else is going to believe her. Not even her own aunt believes her. And another example, if you think about it, is um, Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland as well. It started the same way. No one believed her. Everyone thought she was nuts for what she saw, and she had convinced herself she made it up. Think about all of that. The, and the return to Oz affected how it was, how the location, how the language, how everything came together was reflected in the darkness of that film. That film was dark, that film was nasty, that film was, if you remember the wheelies, they were nasty and her with all the heads. Again, it's as the characters change, so their perception of their world changes. 
you have to be aware of that. What you're writing is, if you're creating a world, it's a dynamic world and nothing happens in isolation. Everything that happens affects everything else that happens. Every character who does one thing affects what other characters do. And, you know, we've talked about that in previous, previous episodes. Now, to come back to my main point, what I was talking about was, you see in all of these groups, you see in all of these books, you see in all of these gurus, these experts about writing, that there are rules which you must follow, my boy. You must follow these rules, you must show, you must not tell. You must use dialogue in a certain way, you must not use adjectives, you must not use adverbial phrases, you must not do this, you must have it this long, you must have it that long, you must use chapters, you must use this style of grammar, you must use this style of language, you must, you must, you must, you must, why? I could show you a technically perfect piece of writing. And I could show you a stale and sterile piece of writing with no passion in it. Because look at this. Every great artist didn't follow the rules. Picasso was famous for saying, I want to learn all the rules so I know how to break them properly. So by all means, know the rules, but you don't have to write the rules. Nothing irritates me more than I will spend hours writing an article, writing a piece of a piece, writing an article, writing a, a short story, writing something and then I put it on a group on Facebook or I publish it online. And you know the first thing I hear for the most, oh but you didn't do this. This is using this style of grammar and you've got a spelling mistake. Really? That's all you're going to say that someone may have written an excellent piece of writing but all you're interested in is criticizing some little teeny semantic element I, i'll use an example my friend joe he's learning the craft he may not be perfect grammatically linguistically or stylistically yet but he can write good he's written pieces and i've read them and they're they're fantastic they're good they have so much potential because everything else, you refine that out in the editing process. Your first, you know, Stephen King, among others, has had it attributed to them that your first draft is going to suck. And it will. It will suck. Neil Gaiman said it. Your first draft is going to be terrible. And there's absolute 100% certainty this will be so. No doubt. Your first draft is going to be horrible. But your first draft could be excellent because that's where all of your ideas are coming together where your story is starting to develop your characters are starting to take shape your story is being told you could write as i said a technically perfect piece of writing perfect grammar perfect use of language perfect showing not telling perfect rules of dialogue perfect this 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 but it's bland because there's no passion in it. Because passion is what makes your writing zing. It's what makes it leap from the page. It's what draws people in. Let me use an example. I could say, sorry about that, my wife interrupted me there, sorry. So let me give you two examples. I'll give you one that is technically perfect, and I will give you one that has passion and feeling in it. So, technically perfect first of all, it was a cold, it was a dark, it was a thunderous night. The lightning was flashing around and everybody noticed it. His heart was quickening, his pupils dilating, sweat, cold and wet was spreading down his back. Everything was dark, lit and with a strobing glow, Flash, 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 flash. And th this one's really not working out. Well, let me just go straight into the passionate storyteller. The night was cold and dark. It was as if the very gates of hell had opened and sucked all the light out of the world. The lightning was flashing and 
sparking like exploding light bulbs and everything was thrown into stark relief. The color was sucked out of the world in a strobing flashing. It brought out fear and made you think of the monsters that were lurking in the darkness that you could not see, that you could not feel, that you could not even know were there, but you knew they were there somewhere. They were stole the breath from your body, it took the, the strength from your soul, it brought your, your eyes flashing images in front of your very consciousness. Everything was just noise and crashing and banging and destruction and fear. The first one isn't technically perfect. The second one isn't either. I'm doing a lot of telling, but it sounds good, doesn't it? The passion in my voice, if translated into written language, is going to draw people in. If that's my first opening scene in a book, people are going to be interested. Now, I could say it was dark, there was a great storm, the great storm made everyone afraid. Nobody liked the storm, it was a cause of an adiabatic depression descending upon the world coming from the west. Rain fell in a deluge and great quantities thereof and everything was dry except for everything that was wet. That doesn't draw anyone, it is a bit of it. As if the Noah himself was about to come into, come over the horizon in his ark. That everything was the rain was falling in sheets of argent fire and pounding, pounding, pounding. The dirt and the dust and the very road into submission. And it sounds a little bit better. You see, you have to think about passion. Passion, if you don't have passion in your writing, you are, I will be completely frank and blunt, wasting your time. Let that sink in for a moment. I'm not messing around, I'm not wasting time on people who are not going to really pour their soul into it. I see people out there that you can't recycle the same old ball genre over and over again and all the same tropes of vampires and demons and half angels and half demons and half trolls and half cats and half everything who are suffering from gender fluidity problems and our secret homosexual, heterosexual, les lesbian, tortured angels who've had a hard life and are dealing with issues from their past and possible abuse by a family member. It's been done and 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 it's been done. I can tell you one, of the, one thing to give a hint at what I'm writing at the moment. It's going to involve half angels, it's going to involve demons, it's going to involve angels, it's going to involve all kinds of things from that mythos, but it is going to do it in a way that is both believable and frightening. It's going to be believable to the point that you are going to be scared of what you are reading. You're going to be looking over your shoulder, you're going to be thinking, that was weird, what was that? What's that noise? What's that noise? Where's that noise coming from? Is that what I think it is or is that something else? You know what I'm saying? Once that car alarm goes off and starts interrupting my my flow here a little bit, it's destroying my conversation just a little bit. It worked with a delay. It was the speed of sound traveling, you see. But it's the way we have to think about it. We have to think about how we inject passion, originality, us into the book. Because if you're for you to be passionate about what you're writing about, you have to believe in it. You have to love it. You have to have it matter to you and you have to punch your keyboard while you're doing it and thankfully it didn't fall on the floor. You have to have passion. Because like I said, if you don't, you're wasting your time. If you, if you are writing because it's the cool thing to do now, trying to get money, trying to get famous quick, you're wasting your time. Because you won't. Look at these reality TV stars we see. They're common and they're going. One year we have relative TV star X, Y, Z, and they're gone before we know it. Unless it's something really controversial and ridiculous, like, shall we say, a certain family whose last name begins with K. They keep doing 
they keep doing controversial things. They keep people interested. A certain reality TV, a certain business related reality TV star went as controversial as you could possibly get to keep himself and that wig of his in the public eye. And why? Why are you going to do that when you could make your name doing what you want to do? I'm in writing and I'm doing all of this not to make money because it's what I passionately believe in. It's what I want to share what I am passionate about. about. I want passionate about. I want to share what I believe in, what I love. And if other people read it, joy, oh joy and wonder. I love that. Here's an example from a very beloved director of mine, M. Night Shamayalan, or however you say his name. I can't remember. Sorry, Knight, if I get your name wrong and if you happen to watch this video, which I, which I doubt. It'd be nice if you do watch it. Give me a great review, man, for, for the plug of Lady in the Water and movies like that. And Lady in the, in the Water is a movie I'm going to mention. In that movie, a mythical creature comes and looks for a person who happens to be an author, a writer, who also happens to be the director, Mr. Knight himself. And you know what's going to happen with his book. He's going to finish his book. He's not going to be famous. He's not going to be popular. But one man in the future will find his book in the library of the orphanage where he is. And he will change his life and he will, having read that book, will change the world. Think about that. Do you want lots of people to grab your book and buy it and then toss it in the trash and never read it again? Or do you want someone 50 years from now to pick up that book and read it and go, oh my God. How could this man 50 years ago know how I'm feeling? How could this book I was given to read by my teacher at school that I found in the library, that I found in an old library, that I found in a, in a charity or junk store, change my life so deeply? Instead of saying, oh, this book is good, I like it, it's enjoyable. Let me, throw it, uh, let me put it under my bed and never look at it again. If you're writing and you're truly passionate, you are searching for immortality. That's why my books touch, touch on immortality. That's what we are all looking for, isn't it? We're all looking for immortality. We don't want to be dead and forgotten. We want to be Shakespeare. We want to be Dickens. We want to be Chaucer. We want to be that guy who everyone remembers long time after they're dead. And if you write mediocre, recycled crap, that's not going to happen. If you write with the passion of your heart and the love of your heart, something that is not only current, something that is not only part of the fashion of today, but something that touches people deeply, something that is timeless, then that's where you need to go. Think about it for a moment. How can you make your work unique and how can you inject everything you've got in here into what you're writing think about that the passion the love the joy of writing i joke about it that the words have me captive that i am captive of the words that i am prisoner that i am a hostage of the words but i am because those words push me those words are within me and they have to come out they have to flow, they have to mean something, and everything I love and believe in has to flow out too. And that's what makes me a writer, not because I want to create a memoir of my sufferings of two years ago, or my difficult life as a child, and everything like that. I would say, if you've got a memoir to write, wait. Establish yourself as a writer first, so that people actually give a shit about what you're going to write about later about your memoir. But if you start off as a memoir, you are just entering into the endless trope of millennials writing their memoir when they haven't even gotten into full adulthood yet. I could write a memoir if I wanted to right now, and that memoir is going to be about a thousand, <coughs> excuse me, about a thousand pages long. With editing and with it being concise, 
because of the things I've lived in my life, there are few people in this world who know what I've been through in my life. But I could write a captivating, a fantastic, an amazing memoir of everything I've been through. But I'm not going to yet. I'll do that when I'm in my 60s maybe and my career is starting to die down and interest is still there and people want to know, oh this Alan J. Fisher guy, the one who wrote all those cool books that we love, what makes him tick? I will go here, my man, where I'll read it. Now you will know. Once my life has reached the point where I can go no further, I have done everything I wanted to do and I'm relaxing now. That's when I write my memoir, not before my career has even started. Now, of course, if you want to write your memoir, I'm not going to stop you. But I would recommend strongly against it. Find your passion first. Find your passion to create, to craft, to forge words into passion and powerful meaning. To bring to life people who don't, didn't exist until they popped out of your head. Do that first. And you're probably going to hate some of the things that I'm saying. But one thing that I am is direct, I'm honest, I'm truthful. I'm not successful in a financial way, but I'm reaching people. A lot of people are being reached by what I'm writing. And the fame and the fortune, maybe that can come later. And that's what I'm leading up to. Next year, next week, I'm gonna make sure we do our video. I'm going to bring us into the new year, and the new year, I would like us all to make a resolution that we are going to write our hearts out. We are going to tell us stories that will blow away anything that preceded them. We are going to create worlds and people and incidences and occurrences and scenes and actions and the things that take place that nobody has ever done before that we're going to be unique, we're going to be crazy, we're going to be wonderful, and we're going to make art in a way that people have maybe forgotten. We're going to create something wonderful, each and every one of us, for that new year. We are going to express what is us in such a way that everyone who's going to read it is going to go, whoa, I have to own this book. And next year I'm going to have a big project in front of me that I'm going to rework my novellas to such a degree that they're going to shine. Because there's no such that you can't have a statue, a piece of metal, a work of art that you just leave to gather, that you create it and then you just leave it to gather dust. You have to polish it occasionally. And I'm not perfect, but I've got a passion to achieve perfection. And that's why I'm trying to communicate to you guys that passion to achieve affection is what you need. That passion to excel, that passion to be best. Not to be just like this person over there who has had success. Screw them. They've got their way. You have to find a way that you are going to let your passion explode and give you success in yourself. Because there's, no, there's not going to be any feeling of achievement or of accomplishment if you just write a slightly altered fanfic but there's going to be a feeling of accomplishment this fan this world that you have crafted this world that you have forged and created and brought to life and pulled put in characters that are believable identifiable and cause emotional reactions in people and that have people actually care about them. That if you kill off a character, people really get affected by that. That's what you want to create. Not somebody dies, oh damn, what a shame. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, I don't really know who they were though, but they're dead. Someone's going to say, you know, this is a pure example. I'm going to go, shit. Kali Addis is dead. Now what? Who's going to do this? Who's going to hold them all together? Who's going to pull them? Who's going to who's going to keep Alexander sane? Who's going to who? And that is unexpected, isn't it? That's what you need to look at. You need to look at keeping 
them engaged, keeping them drawn and keeping telling that story. So they want more. You can't just throw out 20, 30, 40,000 words without passion in every single one of them. And I'll finish up now, but it's an example I used, and this is one I want you, I'll leave you with, I want you all to imagine. Everybody's mother, or female relative that raised them, created that one meal. That one meal that made us feel special, that made us feel amazing, it always tasted incredible. And whenever we were down, whenever we were suffering, whenever we probably wanted some of that. And after we left home, and we're living alone, and things were starting to go down the pipes, we decided to try and make it ourselves. Give us a bit of memory of mum, and give us a bit of memory of comfort. And it never turned out the same, did it? Never. Never turned out the same as the way mum made it. And one day, after lots of experimentation, thinking we knew, thinking we watched every step she made. We, try, we asked her, but I've, I've tried to make your, your casserole, your stew, your, your whatever it was. And it just doesn't come out the same. What am I doing wrong? And she would say to you, but my child, I filled it with love. With love for my husband or absent parent. And with love for my children so that they would be happy. Powerful, isn't it? And also true. You have to fill your writing with love, with passion, with something that means something to people, so that people will try and copy you, and they won't be able to. Some will try and capture what you captured, and they can't, because they're not you, because they're not filling it with the love, with the passion that you're filling it. And that's it for this week. There's a lot of noise going back on the background here. It's Christmas Day. People like to celebrate here their Latins. They like the loud music. They used to retire. But I will leave you with that. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you all. Please check out my website and my postings from today about the freebie that we're doing. I'm serious. You're going to love this book. Please take it now rather than paying $2 for it like next week. And I will be working on some signed copies as well. I'm only doing ebooks at the moment because the budget is limited and I can't buy a ton of, ton of books and mail them out to people all over the world. So I'm afraid ebooks is all you're getting for now. One day soon, I will start doing giveaways of signed copies of the actual books. And once the novels are in progress, oh yeah, you're going to get signed copies. For those of you loyal folks who have been here from the beginning. And once I'm huge and rich and famous. I will not forget you all. <laughs> okay. Happy Christmas, guys. Happy week to come. Happy last week of 2017. Love you all. Thank you. Enjoy. It's been a pleasure, as always. Take care. Bye-bye.